Welcome, guys. We're uh, we're here to talk today about uh, the transfer layer, scalability, cross-chain bridging, uh, the technical problems, the operational problems, the UX problems. This is just a panel of problems today, but it's also a panel on opportunities. Uh, we've seen a huge amount bridge over between other protocols in Solana, between other protocols and other protocols. Uh, you know. We think of bridges as something new, but bridges are how DeFi has used Bitcoin as collateral for quite a long time at this point, right? It's, it's kind of funny to think about how this started as we're taking an asset that's considered quite stable and solid that has no smart contract ability and being able to use that in Ethereum. And that, that early day work really set the stage for, I think, a lot of what we're seeing today. But bridges go far beyond just this idea of how do I move something from chain A to chain B. Uh, there's, there's roles in them as being decentralized ways to pass messages between different chains. There's a role for them in making users feel safe about trading across chains. And there's a role about them about creating um, an exit ramp, too, uh, so that if you do something like buy an NFT for $69 million, uh, you're not dependent on one chain to hold that. Right? There's an ability to migrate in a decentralized and trustless way. Um, so we're going to get into a bunch of that uh, today. Uh, I'd say let's just uh, go ahead down the line and give a quick introduction to yourself and your project. Sure. Uh, I'm Hendrik. I'm with Jump Crypto. And as Jump Crypto, we're co contributors to Wormhole, which is a cross chain messaging protocol connecting high value chains. And message passing in this sense means anything can flow between these high value chains, meaning assets and data. So your coins, NFTs, but also governance decisions and more information like as a base layer for developers to build on top of. Brian from Layer Zero. Um, our focus is purely generic messaging interop. Uh, high level is connect every contract on every chain to every contract on every other chain. Hi, everyone. My name is Alex Smirnov, and I'm co-founder of DeBridge Protocol, which is cross-chain interoperability and liquidity transfer protocol. So the protocol itself allows to bridge any arbitrary assets or data between any uh, blockchains, and including Solana, of course, down the road. Hi, I'm Andre from Allbridge. I'm a co-founder there. Uh, we currently support seven blockchains, and I hope that this number would increase to 12 by the end of the year. We started in July, and since July, we breached to Solana 1.5 billion worth of assets. It's great to see. So I want to start out with just a kind of a, a level set question, and uh, Andre, we'll start with you. Why is it important for a bridge to not rely on trust? You see, when we speak about trusted bridges and trustless bridges, and that is the question, I, I suppose, yes. uh, we have to consider that while we all here are b building decentralized future, which should be completely trustless, in my personal opinion, sometimes uh, we may sacrifice some uh, layer of some level of decentralization to provide a faster and better user experience. Because uh, we are, in the end of the day, we are limited by the technology. And uh, I, I have been thinking a lot about that, because uh, in the very end, we are building for our users. And we want to create the product that would be used and used easily. And when we, in some cases, add too much of decentralization, that can affect user experience in a bad way. And this is something that we should consider as the owners of the business, right? So it is not so simple. I mean, as I said in the very beginning, I'm like 100% over decentralization. I'm just saying, let's not forget about users. They're going to use us as our product in the end of the day. Sure. So, Brian, when you're looking at something like this, is it possible? We talk about bridges, but these are more than just bridges, right? It's not like you're just, you know, you take a bridge on a car, you're over the bridge, you're done. If the bridge falls down next week, you're, not, you're still fine. You've gone over the bridge. But there's a different relationship here when we're moving wrapped assets. Um, can you talk a little bit about how users manage that and how you're thinking about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that is the case when you do use wrapped assets. But I think wrapped assets are, are you're always going to need wrapped assets for the primary chains, right? Because it's not like Ethereum can deploy a contract to mint ETH anywhere. But when you're talking about projects, Aave, Curve, like MIM, all these things, right? You're getting, as projects move more and more uh, to multiple chains, they're starting to deploy their token more and more on multiple chains. And you have the ability to actually use native assets, right? So you can swap a real MIM for a real MIM rather than having 
four different bridges which have four different versions of wrapped MIM coming in. And so I, I do think it's important to realize that over time, the expectation should be that we do move away from wrapped assets. I don't think wrapped assets have to be the future for every project. We've done it because we have something that's interesting on one chain and we want to like create a synthetic on another chain. Um, but these projects are starting to deploy wider uh, and you will see much more of their own native and especially when you have something whether it's rebalancing or something like x sushi or spell or any of these things right it's very important when you're getting a wrapped asset you're getting like a vanilla erc20 equivalent where there you know there is none of that and it creates a lot of issues uh, so i do think it's important to realize that moving forward we will likely see or want to see native assets much more than wrapped assets yep and that I can, yeah. add, I can add here that wrapped assets is, is only kind of a gateway uh, to get into the asset that user wants to get in. Because eventually cross-chain interoperability will be all about the user experience. As a user, I don't want to know what is breach at all. I just want to open my wallet like Phantom or MetaMask. I want to swap from one asset to another. And I don't care whether it went through wrapped asset or through some liquidity pools. I just want to receive the desired asset in the target chain. So I, I truly believe that eventually like bridges will be kind of TCP IP, what TCP IP did for internet. So that's what true cross-chain interoperability protocol will do for the internet of blockchain. So it's all about delivering of the user experience. And uh, yeah, the only point of interaction between like user and DeFi will be the wallet or like decentralized applications like one inch or Paraswap. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm going to push you a little bit on that because every step in the wrapping process is a point of either failure or a point of trust, right? You could have Bitcoin that was originally wrapped onto Ethereum, that's moved to Polygon, that's moved to Solana, that's moved to Binance Smart Chain, that's moved back to Solana. Uh, how do you simplify that, that chain of custody experience for a user? And how much should users actually care about that? Uh, I believe that users do not care about that. I mean, the regular user. And as a wrapped asset, like for example, what we do at DeepBridge, we have a wrapped asset like in different blockchains. But if you breach from the secondary chain to the secondary chain, so you basically burn the uh, wrapped asset in one blockchain and you mint it in another. And of course, there is kind of an additional risk of the consensus algorithm of the specific blockchain. But that the risk that user takes because because he know that he is going to bridge this asset to this blockchain blockchain. And in case something will happen like with a consensus algorithm in this specific blockchain, it's just the kind of collateral in this specific blockchain will be drawn. And that's the risk that user takes. Yeah, I think, I think the user doesn't care in, until something goes horribly wrong, right? And then the user cares a lot generally, but definitely. Do you think wrapped assets should trade at a discount? That's a good question. Um, of course not. <laughs> I, think. I mean, there's there's some inherent risk depending on the wrapping mechanism, and I think likely over time you could see that. I think demand right now, the, the value of a wrapped Bitcoin is, well, all right, I don't want to trigger a lot of people, but you can generate yield on a wrapped Bitcoin that you can't generate on an actual Bitcoin, right? So uh, there's actually maybe the argument that the wrapped asset should trade at a uh, premium rather than a discount, but uh, I love it. You know, I'll leave it there. I love it. Uh, I think the, the core assumption below that is, is really that notion of trust, because that's essentially what the bridge establishes. The bridge establishes trust between chains that can't verify each other or can, can't yet, like verifying a proof of work chain, verifying different consensus mechanisms, all of these, like, in order to verify this trust or establish trust between these chains, they're really, it's, it's complex mechanisms that differ between any kind of chain. And I think that's what we all essentially bridge in the beginning at the very like base layer. We establish trust between these chains. And of all bridges, I think the, the most important aspect should be is establishing that trust and making sure that the bridge is going to be alive and the bridge is, go uh, bridge is going to be secure. So this, the, the notion of, of liveness and safety as like the core properties of the bridges and then applications being built on top but relying on this core aspect. And the risk that sits at this core protocol then trickles down into the applications built on top of the bridge, eventually wrapped assets, and that's where you could risk, uh, like risk discount apply risk discount to, to wrapped assets, but that would hopefully be as small as possible if we all do our jobs right. And yeah. uh, there is one more thing to that, like combining trust to the bridges and what we discussed before about the wrapped assets. So let's say we have a, an asset coming from Ether to Polygon, so it's being wrapped, issued on Polygon. Then from Polygon we take this asset, we take this asset and rewrap it on Solana. Then on Solana, this asset, I'm speaking from experience, it's get on Sabre, our partners, converted to the native asset on Solana. 
So for user, it is one seamless flow. It is good. It is all under the hood. But for us, it is sometimes scary because ultimately that means that bridges should trust each other because a point of failure before the assets come to my bridge can essentially affect my performance as well. And it would not be my security problem. It would be problem of other bridge, but I will end up with the wrapped asset that is locked on my bridge, which due to the hack or something, it costs zero. So what should I do? And uh, this is, again, the question, how can bridge trust each other? What should be the protocol? What can be uh, the thing to unite us and uh, resolve this issue? But that's the risk that liquidity providers actually take, right? So it's not about like cooperation between bridges, but more like whether users are able to swap from like wrapped asset to any other asset within this specific ecosystem, like Solana or Polygon, whatever. So yeah, basically when liquidity providers provide liquidity in pair of like wrapped asset, paired with the, for example, most liquid asset of this specific blockchain, they, they trust to bridge and they should kind of believe that bridge is truly decentralized and trustless. So users do not bear so much risk, in fact. The risk is mostly on liquidity providers, but the cross-chain interoper interoperability is not only about the swaps, right? First of all, it's all about the delivering of arbitrary messaging or arbitrary call data. Because what I personally would like to see is when protocols on Ethereum could be kind of composable with the protocols on Polygon. So let's say algorithmic stablecoin on Ethereum opens up position on the mango markets to maintain its pack. And that would be awesome. And that, for, in order to accomplish that, we need to have truly decentralized channels to deliver messages between cross-chain. Yeah, so Hendrik, you guys have been doing a little bit of, uh, of work on that. I want, I want to ask you two questions. The first is on the capital efficiency of bridges, and the second is on use cases for bridges that are not just assets. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right now, if, if we just look at the, the, the wrapped assets, I would say, of course, they are, in a sense, capital efficient, but they could be more. Like, there have been people talking about, like, increasing capital efficiency by using the capital on the one side where it's locked into... Um, the, the bridging contract, and then also using the wrapped asset on the other side, so essentially double yielding and, and double earning. Um, I think that is something that is interesting, but I think that should live obviously above the base trust layer of the bridge. Um, but this is something that is certainly interesting, but then when you're talking about should wrapped assets trade at a discount, you involve like even more smart contract risk. You yes. layer risk, risk, risk on top of each other. And um, there the point of UX comes in that we've approached a couple times here. How does a user understand who do I need to trust when I use this wrapped asset, when I use this bridge, when I use cross-chain lending? Um, and I think right now the user experiences do not really do that well. I think we've got yeah. a lot of work to do in educating users, giving them a reliable risk score, um, and then we can tap into these pools. But before, and especially as everything is moving so quickly, I'm kind of afraid in tapping into that. But Thanks. as long as users are getting educated that this is happening, I mean, the bridges already allow that in a sense. Like, for example, the wormhole has message passing, and you can add new layers on top. As we said, it's kind of like the TCP IP layer. You can build. Um, a protocol that is more capital efficient on top of it and launch it today. Yeah, so let's talk for a second about, about that component of both moving things like NFTs and enabling protocols that are, are now moving cross-chain, right? Something like Lido, which now exists in multiple chains, multiple layer ones. Um, how is that communication being managed for something like that in, as, a, as a broad concept, not Lido specifically? And then like, what is the role of a bridge? Is that the right analogy to think of uh, for something passing messages back and forth? I also just want to chime in real quick and say that uh, one of the things, everybody right now is, is because you, you said you wanted to kind of touch on future. And yes. I feel like everybody right now is focused on an individual coming like one user coming and wanting to bridge their assets from chain A to chain B, but my, my very firm belief is that in the future, 12 months from now, whatever, 95% of bridging is going to be driven by applications and not by users. Users will come and they'll use a Uniswap or they'll use, you know, whatever it may be that they're going cross-chain and they'll be completely abstracted away from the bridging process, right? So it's, it's not going to be driven by an individual user coming and saying, oh, yeah, I'm doing this bridge, I'm accepting this risk, et cetera. It's going to be how can you integrate that into an actual UI that's that's functional and makes sense and the, the application is comfortable with, with whatever the trust assumptions are, if there are any, and uh, yeah. Yep, so you see that layer moving from something that's more user-facing, like a Venmo-style experience, to something that's more like an interbank transfer. 
I mean, I, I think the user, you know, wh whether it's lending or whether it's swapping right now, like I think the process is not going to be that you do some action in a protocol on chain A, you leave, you grab a bridge, maybe you have to jump through another chain and then another bridge, and then like you go do something on the other thing. It's taken an hour, you've paid seven fees and switched wallets and got native gas. Like that just can't be the way that's going to happen, right? The user is going to sit in an application, do a transfer, and something is going to happen on the other chain. I think you know every every sort of talking about that process of triggering arbitrary messaging on the other chain, but I think that has to live at the application layer, not at the individual user walking through this entire process piecemeal. I, I think that's a really good point, because actually when you ask us about future, yeah. we also can only make assumptions. It's like if you had asked me one and a half years ago, yeah. will, you, will I be trading degenerate apes and like getting yield on NFTs, I would have said, you, Austin, are you crazy? But now we're in this <laughs> world, and truth is, I think none of us can predict what exactly is going to happen. Yeah. What we can do is design the bridges in such a way that we enable developers. And I think that's the key goal to build these experiences, to build um, new applications that can do all these things. Uh, yeah, I love that. So talking about enabling developers, um, so if we go over uh, to Andrew, you've been talking about, like, on Solana, you guys have bridged a ton of assets. Yes. Um, and that's not just going into direct people's wallets, oftentimes that's going into different dApps across Solana. Talk about kind of that developer work, how that integration works between the bridge and the application that the user is trying uh, to use. We were speaking about the future, and that is exactly the future we're thinking about. It is like um, we're calling this concept bridge as a service. Bridge, it is just the tool for users and for developers. So we would be more and more moving from the UI itself to some APIs and some connection with projects and developers, and this is how, for example, we built our whole strategy. We are not just the bridging assets. We bridge the asset, and then on the destination chain, we partner up with Sabre, we partner up with Orca, we create a flow. Because for users, the bridge, it is just like, you know, it's a toll road. And people, they don't want to think about the road. They want to drive with their wife and kids from point A to point B. They don't care about the road. And this is what's happening here. And those bridges that would provide more flexible functionality, so for developers it would be easier to build on top of them, those are the ones that would succeed in future. And by future, I mean like 6 to 12 months from now. It is not distant future. It is not like years. It is soon. This future is coming in soon. But in this sense, Bridges is more like B2B business, because I believe that like, other protocols and projects should be integrated with Bridges, not users themselves. And we provide decentralized infrastructure, decentralized framework, so that other protocols and projects can build on top of it. And uh, yeah, so for, for, for example, I think eventually, like many projects and protocols, you'll want to kind of scale up and tap into user bases of other blockchain ecosystems, like Solana, for example, for project from like Ethereum. And uh, the main challenge here is to let actually protocols to build on top of this infrastructure. And in this case, we don't need to have kind of censorship, whitelisting, et cetera. So we just need to provide kind of tooling so that any protocol can breach their asset and any protocol can pass an arbitrary data cross-chain that will be executed in the target chain, right? So we, we can actually let like protocols to decide on how they can how they can do partnerships like with Orca or other DAXs in other blockchains as well. So in a way, we're talking about a, a composability layer for bridges. Yeah. Interesting. And I mean, to a certain degree, we're already there with mm -hmm. um, applications building that on top. You already said Lido. Uh, Lido has staked Sol, they've staked ETH, and then they get bridged to a protocol like Anchor on Terra, and suddenly you have like a savings, pro uh, savings product, <laughs> and that is what the user then consumes. This is the end user goal. I just want to put my money in and like get interest or get some kind of yield, and everything else is abstracted in the background. And I mean, this is one of the first steps, and then we go further and further and further. We bring protocols truly like multi-chain. Like if I hold comp on Solana, maybe I want to be able to participate in governance. Um, I, I shouldn't lose that right on another chain. Um, and oh. enabling this, but these are next steps, and I think but to a certain degree we're already there. Yeah, awesome. I think unified governance is something that's going to be a very hot topic over the next period, uh, almost certainly. Yes. Well, we'll have to do another one on a cross-chain governance protocol sometime later. Thank you all for joining us today. Thanks, Austin. Thank you.